Great, thank you, Bryn, and welcome. Um, as Bryn mentioned, um, I'm Jeff McGeehan, the Executive Director for the Land Trust. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we're indeed really excited to hear from Doug Tallamy. Um, and when what I can see on my screen, uh, it's a great turnout, so thank you. Um, since I think we have a lot of new people joining us, um, before we introduce our speaker, um, I'd like to provide a little background on the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust, LLCT. Um, the LCT is a private nonprofit conservation organization whose mission is to help preserve the rural character of the town. Uh, we steward over a thousand acres of conservation land, both fee owned and through conservation restrictions. And we also help the town conservation department manage over 80 miles of interconnected trails. And our outreach and education events reach well over a thousand participants annually. Um, a great part of the success of the Land Trust through the years is thanks to the dedication of its members and supporters. Um, there are many ways you can help support our work, and I just want to touch on one of those this evening, and that's membership. Um, our members are critically important for the Land Trust, as we could not do our conservation work without your generosity. Uh, the financial support provided by your membership helps fund a vast majority of our annual operating budget. So again, to all our members, thank you. Uh, many of you will be receiving a membership reminder for 2023 via email or snail mail. And actually, I think uh, that may even have arrived today, so good timing. Um, and we hope you'll consider supporting the Land Trust again this coming year. Um, as you know, the past few years, we've seen an incredible increase in people enjoying our conservation land and trails. And while this comes with its challenges, we view this as an overall net positive for conservation. And now more than ever, we need your support to help maintain our trails, preserve our biodiversity, protect additional lands, and educate the community on critically important conservation issues such as what you're going to hear from Doug Tallamy tonight. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact the Land Trust if you're interested in joining, volunteering, or just finding out more information about the organization and conservation in Lincoln. Um, you can explore a lot of good information on our website at lincolnconservation.org. So with that, I think the promotions are done, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Barnes, our board chair, who's going to talk a little bit about the Land Trust's commitment to mitigate climate change through promoting biodiversity and carbon sequestration, and then she'll introduce Doug. Michelle. You're Michelle, muted. you're muted. <laughs> and <I'm> mute. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you all for being here, particularly our esteemed speaker, uh, Professor Talami. Uh, tonight, we warmly welcome Professor Doug Tallamy, who has written many books and won many well-deserved awards on his science-based research, outreach, and conservation efforts to restore biodiversity and ecosystem function through the planting of native plants, a foundational action each and every one of us can do to make a crucially important difference to our environment. Doug is the TA. Baker Professor of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Delaware. In 2021, he co-founded homegrownnationalpark.org to help regenerate biodiversity for a more sustainable climate and wildlife friendly environment, one person at a time, by encouraging people to plant native plants at home. To quote Doug, in the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. Doug's presentation tonight sets the stage for the LLCT's continuing efforts to mitigate climate change through promoting biodiversity and carbon sequestration. These efforts began with our pollinator action plan in 2020 to increase the share of native plants in Lincoln. Thousands of straight species native pollinator friendly plants have been planted in Lincoln since then. 
and to connect these microhabitats to create a pollinator pathway through town. Our efforts continued with additional programming in spring 2022 as we collaborated with Mothers Out Front and Codman Farm to help educate us all about the importance and the how-to of promoting healthy soils and carbon sequestration in healthy soils. This fall, we further collaborated with these groups and local citizens to promote local diversity, biodiversity through demonstrations of lawn to meadow conversion, gardening for wildlife and biodiversity, wild seed collecting, and winter sowing. With Doug's talk tonight, we are kicking off our newest related effort, which consists of sustained calendar-based education on seasonal earth-friendly tips and tricks for backyard ecological gardening for biodiversity and increased carbon sequestration. Doug, welcome. We very much appreciate you being here with us tonight and look forward to learning more from your research and your personal example. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Michelle. Okay, can we all see that? We're up and running? Great. All right, thanks. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I do want to talk to you about what my idea of nature's best hope is, and I'll, I'll give you a I'll give you a spoiler. You're nature's best hope, and it's an awesome responsibility. And we're going to talk about why. But before we do that, let's talk about what E.L. Wilson said about uh, nature's best hope. Um, he, of course, was a professor at at uh, Harvard for decades. Uh, one of the best scientists uh, that our country has ever produced, extremely productive. And one of the things that was consistent throughout his very long career was his effort to save life on Earth, life on planet Earth. He loved biodiversity, uh, but he wanted to save it for our own good. He knew that it was essential to our own survivor, survivorship. So he wrote in 2016, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. He said that if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. And then uh, he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't tell us a lot about how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, it's a great idea. Uh, we'll just put half the Earth aside and everything will be great. Problem is, half of planet Earth, half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. And we've got 8 billion people in the other half with all of our houses and railroads and airports and detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So a lot of people are scratching their heads. How can we actually do this? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I think we can do it. I think we can realize EO's dream. But we need a new approach to conservation in order to do that. Before we talk about that, let's talk about what happened on the East Coast in 2019. We had very large oak mast. Members of the Red Oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head and it forced its head through there. And it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze. Finally, it escaped. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. In about 30 seconds, down it goes. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa and surprisingly stays underground in that chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do. But that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that is how the larva gets into the acorn. Why spend two years underground? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole, kind of like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, move the entire colony into the new acorn takes about 30 minutes. And after they move in, they post a guard there, make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. 
What's my point with this little story? That's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn and they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree and they tap it below the soil surface. And the object is they're gonna go back in the wintertime and have something to eat. Well, for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrea faciliae, unless you have facilia. That is the only plant, the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have uh, just about 4,000 species of native bees in North America, and over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. Problem is that today, these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy uh, heard that the state of Arizona was going to uh, mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as it was. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. Got 770 million acres of rangeland. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies, changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need them to sustain. And that's because it's nature that keeps us alive on planet Earth. Why have we done this? I don't know, uh, but I suspect that we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline, Followed by this one, North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Now the UN says, well, we're going to lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. They said it two years ago, so now it's the next 18 years. Makes a nice headline, uh, but it is not an option, folks. These are the species that keep us alive on the planet. We have to make sure this doesn't happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment and thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talks about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Go well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrates, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, those food webs would collapse and all of those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers, which rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news and that is that that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We're totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on every day. 
like oxygen. Plants are producing the oxygen we breathe. They're cleaning uh, the water that we need, need and slowing its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are, they of course build their tissues out of carbon that they pulled out of the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And then they pump the extra carbon into the ground that they fix through photosynthesis through their root system. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited over the years. And once it's in the ground, it's extremely stable. It can stay there for thousands of years. Topsoil, they build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight into food. If we lose our plants, we're gonna have to eat sunlight. And that's gonna be hard. What do animals do for plants? Lots of things, but here's some important ones. Pest control services, very important. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services, just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today's a terrible idea because of those 8 billion people that every day are demanding more ecosystem services. Now we do have parks and we do have preserves and they're doing the best they can. Uh, but we're in the sixth great extinction event the earth has ever experienced. So obviously it's not good enough. So we now need to start practicing conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like this. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we, we uh, humans needed to work on our relationship with planet earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is, the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups that have been good at doing that uh, for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Aldo had a lot of uh, faith in humans. He he believed that we were capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things, but he believed we could learn to do them gently enough, carefully enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together we cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. Well, what I want to argue, uh, argue this evening is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we start? Let's go back to private property. Most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not using it uh, as, as I really intend. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left, absolutely. That has been our, our conservation model for the last 100 years. And we want to keep doing that, but we've got to go beyond that now. We have to restore the nature that we've already destroyed. That's restoration. And before you tell me that, well, you're never going to put it back exactly the way it was, um, I understand that. But that's not the goal. The goal is to reconstruct or reunite enough of those specialized interactions so that you can create functional ecosystems again, even if it's not exactly what was on that, that uh, spot at some point in the past. But in order to do that, you, they're, they're building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the most important groups. And there are two groups that we can't do without. One is the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They, of course, are capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food through photosynthesis and storing it in their parts, mostly leaves. So now we have the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet in plant leaves. But most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat something that eats plants, They're typically invertebrates, 
Uh, and those are typically insects, but not just any insects. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't produce a lot of caterpillars, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm gonna use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That's the chickadee we have right here in Southeast Pennsylvania. It's the one at our, our feeders. All the species of chickadees around the country are doing pretty much the same thing as many other birds are too. Um, the, the birds that overwinter are at our feeders eating seed all winter long and we tend to think that's all they need. Well, it turns out that chickadees, titmice and other birds, only 50% of their diet is, is seeds in the winter time. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the winter time. And when it comes time for them to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they have to switch entirely to invertebrates. Uh, and if they are in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees not, are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, this is a citizen science project that uh, one of my my students, uh, Ashley Kennedy, did a few years ago, and it just adds to a body of knowledge that's all saying the same thing. What she did was put out a call to bird photographers across the country and said, please take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they're carrying food to the nest. Send those pictures to me. I will identify the, the uh, prey items that are in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as possible. Uh, and you're looking at, uh, it was very successful. It's got thousands of pictures, did a lot of identifying. And you're looking at a, a summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diets that were caterpillars in 20 of the most common uh, bird families in North America. And in 16 out of those 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen if we design landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars in them? Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton. It's made of chitin. It's undigestible. Uh, and of course, birds don't want a lot of things that are undigestible. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our aphids, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They are nutritious. They're high in fat, high in protein, low percentage of exoskeleton compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible, uh, and many beetles have very sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from during the breeding season? From what they're, they're bringing back to the nest. But look, carotenoid uh, content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids uh, because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. Only the caterpillars eat the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any, any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars uh, are, are not optional parts of bird diets. They're essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. Let's go back to, to chickadees. There are a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of Carolina chickadee to the point where they fledge, where they leave the nest. This depends on the, the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around so nobody can count those. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you're going to have to have all those caterpillars in your yard.
because they only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to get a clutch of a bird that is a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird uh, to maturity. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are, are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the, the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species that don't require insects. So things like doves and finches can actually make a little milk out of seeds, and they don't, they don't need insects. And look, they didn't lose any numbers at all during the last 50 years. But the species that require insects lost, on average, 10 million individuals per species. And this doesn't ca uh, prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take away bird food, you lose the birds. So we need to raise the bar about what we're asking, what we're asking our, our uh, landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to be pretty, as you heard in the introduction. Uh, and we're gonna keep doing that. Pretty is nice, but now they have to be pretty and ecologically functional. And they're not gonna be ecologically functional unless we add caterpillars to our landscapes. So how do we do that? Well, you add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. That seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants do not support caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to choose the plants that do support a lot of caterpillars. Uh, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates it perfectly. It's not an exception. Most of the other caterpillars are doing the same thing, but you can uh, put all of the crepe myrtle and the burning bush and the barberry and the, the calorie pear and the ginkgos and the hostas and all the things we typically landscape with in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's gonna make a monarch butterfly is a milkweed. That's its host plant. That's host, called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Why is that? Remember, plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded the leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well defended. There's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know that they are toxic. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat the plants in which they have specialized on over evolutionary time. They develop particular enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those uh, toxic compounds. But again, it takes a long period of, of uh, association with the particular plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So if, if you take all of the milkweeds out of your yard uh, and replace them with hostas, the monarch is not going to start to develop on your hostas. It is locked into eating milkweed. So it has uh, two choices. One is to fly away and find milkweed someplace else or starve to death. So it turns out uh, that this is actually very simple. There are three kinds of plants out there, plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that actively detract energy, that remove it from local food webs. A great example of a, of a contributor, actually the best example of a contributor is one of our oaks. They're contributing more energy to food webs than any other plants uh, in the country. Good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo. Ginkgo biloba from Asia, pretty plant, pretty tree, good fall color, but nothing eats it. So it's not adding any in. Uh, energy to local food webs. And a good example of a detractor would be calorie pear or any of our invasive ornamental plants, burning bush, barberry. They're not adding energy to our, our food webs and they escape and actively push out the plants that do add energy from our local ecosystems. 
So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild food webs uh, to support these new ecosystems that we're establishing, we have to use the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when we do use the right plants, starting with uh, what has happened at, at uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is where my wife Cindy and I moved in the year 2000 to a farm that had broken up into 10 acre lots, very old farm. The last thing they did was to mow it for hay. Uh, and our, our job, our goal was to uh, rebuild the, the Easter deciduous ecosystem here. Um, well, you're not gonna do that unless you add caterpillars to the landscape. And then I had never tried that before. Uh, so this is one of the things I tried early on was to see if I could get a Canadian owlet to, to start making a living at our house. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. That's what one looks like. It's a pretty little thing. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. But well, you're not going to have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow rue. That's the only plant it eats. Uh, and we didn't have any meadow rue. I'm sure it grew here uh, hundreds of years ago, but uh, our property was farmed for almost 300 years. And the meadow rue is long gone. So I got some meadow seeds from someplace, planted them, and it grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian Alice would be able to find my little patch of meadow root. So uh, I didn't even go out and check it after I planted it uh, for at least two months. And I was walking by for another reason and just glanced over, and it was covered with Canadian Alice. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. And now we have a good population of Canadian outlets and Metaro. So we've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. We didn't have any goldenrod stowaways, but I wanted it to make a living at our house. Uh, by the way, that's a misnomer. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. We didn't have any Bidens. But uh, I did know where there were some Bidens in a power line cut in uh, Bear, Delaware, about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, this, this year, they took over my front yard. We had to wait a full year for the uh, goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens, but it did. And now we have a good population of both of those. So we've added four species to the property now. One of the Hackberry Emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that should be here. But as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any hackberries, so I got a couple of hackberry trees and planted them. We had to wait four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but they did, and now we've got a good population of both of those six species. That's how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. All the Many of the things that require goldenrod came with it, like the beautiful brown-hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now, this is when it hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come. That's what the caterpillars look like, but it's still part of the fun. It's anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I, I check my goldenrod trying to find this caterpillar. One of these years I will find it and that'll be a good year. Plant of Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear some people don't like it. I just don't know why. It's a, it's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them. It's got good fall color. It's a good ground cover. Makes uh, very nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. You know, in the fall, birds need uh, berries that are high in fat. Fat has twice the energy of sugar, so that's what they're looking for. And these, these berries do have a lot of fat. It's a great pollinator plant. Its flowers are tiny and inconspicuous. Most people don't even think of it as a flowering plant. Uh, so how is it a good pollinator plant? Well, you don't even know it's in bloom until you see a big cloud of, of native bees around it. They love those tiny little flowers. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large uh, sphinx moths that are a primary component of cardinal diets. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I get the double tooth prominent in our house just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. It looks like a stegosaurus. Even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm. Uh, particularly American elm. And of course, we lost uh, American elms to Dutch elm disease decades ago. But there are two big elms at the, at the University of Delaware that did not die. So early on, I, I gathered up some seeds from the curb, planted them at home. They germinate in six days. They grow very quickly. Those trees are now 80 feet tall now, and they did attract a double tooth prominent American elm. One of the evening primrose uh, at, at home because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. And believe it or not, we had no evening primrose, 
primrose, no, no enothera. So I planted that. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it gets crowded, but it's always very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the plants that, that we put back. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local landscape, your local food web, and that's the goal, remember, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to call in the moths that produce the caterpillars that run the food web at my house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths had come to the oaks on my property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of this tree. You do not have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute to your local ecosystem. It will happen the very first year. This is what our property looks like most of the time these days. This is where the Bidens uh, invaded this, this summer. Um, so we put the plants back. I mean, that's the point here, uh, at, least, at least some of the plants. And uh, as my, my research progressed through the last 20 years, uh, we found out that uh, you can count the number of moss species in your local food web, and it's a very good index of how stable that food web is and how productive it is. So five years ago, I decided to, to do that to start doing that anyway, to try to count all of the species of moths that are making a living at our house. I do it by taking their picture and I'm still at it, but I am up to 1,199 species of moths that I photographed at our house. Now we've got 10 acres, Pennsylvania's 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, um, we have uh, added 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970, a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We simply put the plants back. <clears throat> Imagine what would happen if everybody put the plants back. We could reverse terrible headlines like this. We really could. But I know what you're thinking. Uh, we've got 10 acres and a lot of people have less land than that. Will it work on smaller properties, particularly in suburbia? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and, and I have. Uh, when they moved, they're in the middle of a development. Everybody's got the big, big lawns. And when they moved into their property, it was loaded with bush honeysuckle, with, with the Almer honeysuckle, another invasive from Asia. So the first thing they did was get rid of that. Then they planted 70 species of native plants, put in a water feature that they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that were using their property. And they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. If any of you are birders, you know that is a very good number. Just to compare that to our house, we've only recorded eight species of warblers at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, she is right next to O'Hare Airport. She has one tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. It's pretty one tenth of an acre because Pam is a native plant landscaper and she knows how to do it. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and then she sat back to count the birds. And she says, with a glass of wine. And she's up to 124 species of birds that she's uh, seen using her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house. 
in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And we do want to succeed in a big way. And one of those got to be, we've got to address those big lawns. We have 44 million acres of lawn in this country, which is an area the size of New England, and it's dedicated to an ecological deadscape. And we know why to do this. The lawn is a status symbol, and we need to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? <clears throat> what if we, let's make the mass simple. Let's, what if we took areas like this and we turned them into this. I got this picture from Dan Getman, had a big lawn, and he said, look, I'm putting the plants back. Uh, well, we could, we could create a new national park at home. We'd have 20 million acres to work with that we could restore right at home, and it would be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? We get the chance to develop a personal relationship with some part of the natural world at our own timing, our own pace. All we have to do is go outside or maybe, maybe even just look out the window. We can avoid crowds. <clears throat> you know, if you go to a real national park these days, 375 million people will be there with you. That was the attendance last year. It's free, there's no admission fee, it's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike, no travel hassles, you get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is, is essential to developing that personal relationship with nature, not mediated by somebody else. And it's particularly important for our poor kids. We're suffering from uh, nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying, we take 30 kids, we put them on a bus, with the teacher and they drive for an hour and they, they go to a natural area and walk around for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back on the bus and they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it, become friends with it, become comfortable with it. Alone, no parental supervision. When we hover over our kids, we're sending the message that this is dangerous, that there is something to fear here. These, these kids are the future stewards of our planet. They're not going to want to steward our planet if they think it's dangerous and they're afraid of it. We, they have to love stewarding it. And if they don't, they're going to be lousy stewards and we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. Maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature, a little piece of lawn with a hedge. But there are no lizards there. And when she, when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you creep up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of the lizard. You fall in love with that part of mother nature. I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground uh, in her best dress the rest of her life catching lizards. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii uh, the rest of her life. <clears throat> and it's going to help her be a good steward of the planet when she grows up. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to grow, uh, expose kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, please do. Go to our, our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. This is our small nonprofit um, that we have put together to encourage all the people who don't know they are the future steward of, or the future, yeah, the future stewards of the planet. They are the future of conservation. We want them to get that message. So it's free. What you do is you register your property on the map uh, and then put in the area on your property that you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to cut your lawn in half. You put that area down there. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put a, an aster in a flower pot. Whatever the area, you put that in uh, the database. Then your little piece of your county is going to light up. And the object is to get the whole country to light up. So we can see our, our progress towards conservation. We are asking people to reduce the area in lawn because lawn's not helping us out at all. 
What are you going to put there? You're going to put more natives in place of that lawn. You're going to remove invasives that are already on your property. Most people do have invasive plants on their property. And if you owned any protect protected area, we certainly want you to continue to protect it. The ecological product of Homegrown National Park is significant increases in biodiversity. This works, folks. This really works. And a significant drawdown of, of CO2 that's in the atmosphere. When you put plants back, you're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. A third of the carbon that's up there right now has come from us removing the plants on the planet. So putting them back is going to help. Uh, we're also going to build connections, biological corridors between existing preserves, and that will help as well. Our sociological product is national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solution is, that you are the solution. We want to change the culture. We want everybody to recognize that nature's not optional. We have to get serious about saving it, and we all have a responsibility to doing that. And when we build out that map, it's going to uh, provide visual, measurable progress towards the 3030 initiative, UN's 3030 initiative. We're going to save half or 30 percent of the earth by 2030 and 50% by 2050. No way we're going to do that without recording conservation on private property. The benefits of homegrown national park is that it convert, converts hope into action. People are, you know, they're tired of hearing about the problem. They want to do something about it and they can do something about it. We don't rely on governmental support. We would love governmental support, but we don't rely on it. And it merges existing conservation efforts. All the people who belong to Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, Sierra Club, they can all join Homegrown National Park. We're not pulling members away because we don't charge anything. Um, and all of that will, what that will do is unite all these conservation efforts into one aspirational visual. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to join Homegrown National Park. What are we going to put in the, the spaces that we take uh, the lawn out of. I'm gonna argue that at least some of the plants we put in have to be keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. When you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. When we can take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants, the keystone plants, are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants and the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that support that house. They are the support system. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last hundred years. You're not through building your house once you've got your keystone plants in there, but it is an essential first step. So the question is no longer simply, are natives ecologically better than non-natives? On average, they certainly are. Uh, but there are a lot of natives that aren't contributing all that much either. So the, the real question is, do we want to focus on the, the biggest contributors? the plants that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars or not. What is supporting the most caterpillars is one of our oaks. 557 species supported by, by uh, oaks in the mid-Atlantic states, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. How do you find out what the best plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the rank list of both the woody and herbaceous plant genera that are best for your county will pop up. And these are just, uh, the lists are bigger than this. I stopped because I ran out of room. Let's focus on these plants right here, solidago, goldenrods, native asters, perennial sunflowers. Not only are they the best at supporting caterpillars, they're also the best at supporting those, those specialist bees. When you plant a pollinator garden, you wanna plant it for the bees that require particular plants because the generalist bees can use them as well. And if you have goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers in your, your yard, you can support up to 44 species of specialist bees that won't be there if you don't have those plants. So we're gonna shrink the lawn, we're gonna put in keystone plants, we're gonna invite a lot of insects to our yard, then we're gonna kill them with our security light. And of course, that's not the goal. Uh, there's a lot of research that says light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines. And these are all the ways our lights are killing insects. And to me, it's good news because we've got to turn around insect declines, not stop them. We've got to turn around. We've got to have insect increases. And if we can do that by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There's a lot of switches to flick, but, but we can get good at that. And I know what you're going to say. I can't turn the light out over my, my barn or over my garage or over my, my uh, front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to realize is that the bad man does not come very often. 
And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow LEDs available as well. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects. If we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we could save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, millions of dollars as well. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to modify our light system. Then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. Booming business around the country. But these mosquito fogging companies say, it's okay, this is a natural product. It is a natural product, it's pyrethroids, but cyanide is a natural product too. So I don't think that's a good argument. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. Not so, it kills all the insects that it comes in contact with. And look, it comes in contact with all the insects, including all of our pollinators, including the monarch butterfly. Big monarch kills two years ago, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground when they flew through mosquito gel. The ironic thing is it does not control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. You have to kill 90% of them to control them in the adult stage. So we target larval stage. And you can use biocontrol to do it without killing anything but mosquitoes. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, something organic, and put it out in the sun for a couple of days. That will build up the populations of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to mosquito females that want to lay their eggs. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12, something like that. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larva. If a dragonfly larva gets in there, it's not going to hurt it a bit. If your dog drinks it, no problem. You might put a coarse screen in your bucket so the local chipmunk does not commit suicide. Uh, but this is targeted, it's cheap, and if everybody did it, it would really reduce our mosquitoes. But you know, if you want to use your yard for just a few nights during the, the, um, during the summertime when we have peak mosquitoes, get a fan and plug it in. It'll create enough breeze that the mosquitoes cannot uh, fly into you and you'll be much more comfortable. The fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? This is just an example, but I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. And I wish everything did that. Everything happens on the tree, but most species don't do that. 94% of them that use oaks, that use other trees, will drop down after they finish growing as caterpillars and wiggle their way beneath the soil, pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that is the issue. That's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. It's not neat. And we mow and compact the soils under our, our uh, trees so that the soil is rock hard during the summertime. And it's very difficult for caterpillars to get underground and pupate, which means this becomes an ecological trap. We're calling in the moths to lay their eggs. The caterpillars grow, they drop down and die. I'm convinced this is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. This is what most people have. You got a tree in a yard. I've got a new grad student this year who's actually measuring how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee you they're going to do better in a situation like this where you have a layered landscape. You've got your tree, maybe a dogwood, native azalea, ferns, ground cover. Soft landing, the caterpillars fall down. They can easily get underground because the soil's not compacted. Nobody's going to mow them. Nobody's going to step on them. Leaf litter down there to spin their cocoon. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put in big beds around your trees. The bigger, the better. The bigger the bed, the less lawn you have. All safe, safe sites. Use your uh, native ground covers liberally, things like wild ginger, native pachysandra. This is the uh, Virginia creeper, great ground cover. Golden seal, may, may apples, foam flower ferns. If you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants there. Green mulch is the way to go. They're all safe sites and your trees will love it. Another former grad student, Desiree Narango, um, did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. Uh, she and her, her study suggests there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. She had one major question. She said, um, how well do chickadee populations do in residential landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by typical introduced plants? 
And when they're dominated by introduced plants, they support 75% fewer caterpillars. So you, re you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So all the landscapes had, had uh, nest boxes up in them, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, oh, there's not enough, not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to breed. If they did try to breed, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, from none to 100%, this is what you get. The dotted line here is replacement rate. If the population breeds at this rate, um, you, it's, it replaces the adults that die every year. Uh, so it's sustainable. It's not growing but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population. But if you make fewer, anything below the line here, which you have when you've got a lot of uh, native plant, non-native plant biomass, then you have a shrinking unsustainable population. And right here is where those, those lines intersect. This is the area of compromise. It suggests that you can have up to 30% of the woody plant biomass in your yard, non-native without destroying the local food web. Now we can't tolerate any, any invasives here because they're ecological tum tumors. They don't stay in our yard, they escape and wreck the, the natural areas. But there's a lot of, of uh, ornamental plants that are not invasive. Remember Dan Getman's property? This is a ginkgo. What's a ginkgo doing in Dan's native plant landscape? Well, Dan's wife likes ginkgos, and she said, please put one in. So he did. Is it destroying the functionality of this landscape? No. Is it an invasive? Is it going to escape and, and wreck the woodlot? No. It's just there. So I tend to think of plants like this as if they're statues. So there you go. There's Dan's statue. If everything was a statue, it wouldn't work, but you can tolerate this. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those high producing native plants. If we increase, increase the percentage of those, we can tolerate more of these non-natives. Can we use uh, native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lino Shaughnessy design. You don't get more formal than this. It's taken by a drone 400 feet up. Every plant in that landscape is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a landscape like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells your neighbor this is not a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It, it services a number of species of bees. It's not very big. could be bigger. But if everybody did it, it would help a lot. Help what? Help our pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? The media will tell you because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's a very anthropocentric view of it. It's not even right. They pollinate about a 12th of our crops. Uh, but we need pollinators. Forget the crop argument. And, you know, people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. You do need pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Uh, and, and that's not an option. So where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this? This is a Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. Uh, and more and more of them are doing it. Uh, Minnesota has a uh, cost share program that encourages homeowners to reduce or replace their lawn with, with uh, appropriate Minnesota prairie plants, very popular. Pennsylvania has a, a similar plan. There's an island off Florida that encourages people uh, to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If, if we paid you to take care of invasive species rather than find you, if you used your property, everybody would want an invasive, not an invasive, an endangered species on your property. It'd be very popular. Put a bounty on, on calorie pears, on, on uh, these uh, invasive ornamentals that everybody has. That's what uh, St. Louis, Missouri has done. Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina has banned them all together. Actually, Pennsylvania has just put them on the ban list as well. Um, North Carolina has a bounty on them. You take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Utilities are giving people $100 coupons to put in water efficient uh, native plants. And the big uh, 
lawn reduction programs in the far west, particularly California. This has gone up. You get $3 per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you replace with Xeric plantings. California does not have one drop of water to waste on lawn. And if you want more information on all of these programs, memorize that. Okay, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And this first one's important. We're starting to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it, but it's not essential. You know, we go visit it, we go hiking. But when, if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, nature will take a back seat. And resources are always in short supply. Went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save nature, want to save wildlife, so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for, for creating the national park system. We're going to save these wonderful places because we want future generations to be able to enjoy them. And I get that. Nature is enormously entertaining, but it's far more than that. We want to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about that, but if we restrict conservation just to places where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because there's not enough of those places. David Quammen has a perfect uh, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a, a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests that there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our road size, even including much of our, our agriculture. So we have to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back, not just to make biological carters to allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to recreate viable habitats where we've destroyed them. We're starting to do this. This is starting to happen. And when it does happen, it'll be the first time in modern history where we actually have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists, for some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every single human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You were not born with these mindsets. mindsets. You're taught them. We've been very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship, all of us. Doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it. You really need to save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. More and more people recognize the earth is in trouble these days, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can put in keystone plants. One person can, can fire Mosquito Joe. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can remove the invasives that are on their property. We didn't even talk much about that. One person can do all the things I just talked about and completely revitalize the, the little ecosystem where they live, which enhances the greater ecosystem surrounding their property. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problem. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and ultimately our own. So I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. Hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Doug. That was really wonderful and inspiring. And I know that a lot of the people on the call tonight have been involved with the land trust and have planted pollinator gardens and are not blowing their leaves anymore from the oak trees. Um, but I think we all are inspired to do a little bit more after tonight. Um, so we've got a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to just dive right in. 
Um, first question is, do you have a favorite ground cover to go underneath an oak tree? <laughs> I like Virginia creeper. Nobody likes Virginia creeper, but it does so many things um, that that would certainly be one of them. You know, native pachysander is a wonderful ground cover, but the deer love it. So wherever you have too many deer, which is everywhere, um, I would hesitate on that one. But again, there's a lot of them and it doesn't have to be a single species. The, those, those mixed uh, plantings of um, spring ephemerals, you know, bloodroot will bloom in the, in the spring, but the, the leaves, if the deer don't eat them, remain big and viable the rest of the summer. Mix that with foam flower, mix it with Jack in the pulpit. All of those guys create a diverse ground cover. And you know what else? Just plain leaves is fine. If your oak throws too much shade, make sure you've got a good covering of leaves under there that protects the soil community. It protects the moisture. Your oak will love it. So, uh, so that's, that's the easiest thing to do right there. That's great. Um, speaking of ground covers, someone has a question about raking and removing leaves. Would you like to comment well, that's on where that? You, that's where you put them under your trees. Um, so yes, we can't leave leaves on our, our grass, on our lawn. Um, so we tend to rake them off. But remember, we're going to have less lawn. So the place you put your leaves is under those trees. My son bought a house a couple of years ago. And the first fall, he called me up and he said, he said, Dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with them? And I said, put them in your, in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. <laughs> That's how you shrink the lawn. That's where you put your leaves. Uh, and a lot of people worry, oh, my plants won't be able to come up the next year. They're much better at that than we think. So, but if you really, you know, if you got a, a tremendous number of leaves and, and very little place to put them, put them in, a, in a, a compost heap. You want to keep all the leaves on your property because when they break down, they return the nutrients to the soil that your trees used the previous year. If we remove leaves every single year, we're starving our trees to death over, over time. That's very true. Um, you mentioned deer. Do you manage for deer on your property? And if so, do you have any tips and tricks? Well, the trick would be to convince my wife. Uh, and I have been unable to do that. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, you know, so I, I speak with forked tongue. We have way too many deer. They are preventing the, the uh, recruitment into our, our forest. They eat all the, the baby trees that are coming up. They eat the native plants and not the non-native plants. So it pushes the competitive uh, balance against our native plants. One of the reasons so many of these escaped ornamentals are invasive is because the deer don't touch them. They won't eat autumn they won't eat burning bush, they won't eat multifloros, and et cetera. So of course they have a competitive advantage over the, the tiny oak tree that they do eat right away. Um, and Lyme disease. I've had Lyme disease five times because we've got too many deer. Um, so, so there's lots of reasons to control our deer, but it's a sociological issue. You know, it's the Bambi effect. Um, a lot of people just are, are, are not into that. And I understand that, but that's, that's where we need to, to focus on the, the, um, you know, the cultural change, or we can put our predators back you know, we do have a predator now. We've got coyotes, and we also have permission to shoot coyotes anytime we see them. It's the only thing that will take fawns right now. So unless we want to put wolves back and mountain lions too, we should leave our coyotes alone and let them try to control our deer a little bit. The only thing that's controlling deer right now is cars, and that's not an efficient way to do it. There are a thousand people a year that are killed by deer collisions in cars. So it's dangerous. Good reasons to get them under control. That's interesting. Uh, we have a question about cities and um, carbon emissions. They said, how can half of the area in cities be saved for nature? Is there enough ground to, to carve it out? There's no doubt. It's harder to do where everything's paved over. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but you know, think, we're thinking about things like um, apartment buildings, these high rises. Most of them have patios and, and little, little porches. If everybody put container gardens on those porches, it would turn a pile of bricks into a target for, for foraging bees and, and butterflies, things like the migrating monarch. They're good at getting around. They would find those, those uh, golden rods and asters and perennial sunflowers up on your, your balcony uh, very easily. It would help the native bees. So we could get a lot more plants into our cities 
than we have right now without changing anything. But we really should think about getting rid of the cement landscape. I mean, that is not necessary. It's there for, for convenience, but it wrecks the watershed. It creates floods. We all know it's bad. It creates a heat island. So why do we keep doing it? Let's reduce the amount of cement that's on the ground. We, you know, we can have sidewalks, but we don't have to pave over everything. That's that's just laziness. I think you make such a great point that anybody can do this with just a pot and a front stoop or a, a porch. Well, 82% of us live in cities, so we can't eliminate all those people. <laughs> Uh, we have a question about non-native insects, um, like the spongy moth. Are these a helpful source of food, or are they also detracting from, from the ecosystem? Oh, yeah, they're terrible. Uh, when I talk about non-native plants as being bad, so are, well, invasive plants. So are invasive insects. They are all here without their natural enemies. So the spongy moth, the emerald ash borer, the hemlock woolly adelgid, um, the winter moth, these guys are, are hammering us. Um, so no, we don't, you know, it's not that all insects are great. It's the native ones that have co-evolved with the, their host plants and the, the natural enemies that keep them in check. Uh, and the insects we bring over haven't done that. It's not their fault, but they're here with no, nothing to control them. So they go crazy. Spotted lanternfly, feel feel free to step on them anytime you see them. Um, somebody was commenting and sort of wanted an elaboration on your comment that there are some species of birds that don't eat caterpillars. Would having just those birds be enough to support an ecosystem? Um, well, you know, the caterpillars, there's two, two groups of caterpillars that birds don't like. One is the hairy ones which is one of the reasons the birds won't eat, eat the spongy moth. They've got, got a lot of hairs on them. Uh, but there are two birds that do eat them, the yellow bill and black bill cuckoo. They specialize on hairy caterpillars. There's never enough cuckoos around, but uh, they certainly help. Um, and the other reason they don't eat them is when the caterpillar actually tastes bad. So when a caterpillar eats a bad tasting plant like milkweed, it incorporates the the toxin into its com its its uh, hemolymph and its exoskeleton, and it doesn't taste bad as well. So we want to save the monarch, but it's not because the caterpillar is an important component of the food web. The birds <laughs> don't like it. We want to save it because it's pretty. It's good enough reason. <laughs> That's great. Um, someone had a question: Is having a body of water crucial? Because I you gave a few examples, and they both mentioned a little bubbler. Right. Uh, birds love it. They love clean water. It does not have to be big. It can be a small little circulating uh, pot of water. And the reason they like it circulating is that is a signal of clean water. So if they went to drink in the wild, they'd go to a little bubbling brook um, that, that signifies it's not sitting there. The old fashioned bird bath that just sits there and becomes stagnant in one day, birds don't like that. They want it to be moving. Uh, so adding a water feature uh, helps, and it can help a whole lot if you're not near a natural body of water. So we actually have a little stream and, and it goes through our property, and I've got a little water feature, and every once in a while, bird go to it, but not too much. They go down to the stream because it's there. But if you're in a drier area where there's no source of water, they 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 love it, particularly the migrants. They've flown 300 miles at night. They come down, they've got to eat, and they've got to drink. Thirsty. Yeah. Um. Okay, let's see. Next question we have is, could you just elaborate a little bit more about the connection between biodiversity and, and improving climate change resilience and, and native plants sequestering carbon? All plants sequester carbon. So if we're going to put plants in the ground to sequester carbon, why don't we do ones that'll help biodiversity at the same time? And that Excuse me, that's a serious issue. There's big projects like the uh, Trillion Tree Initiative. Um, everybody wants to plant a million trees, and they think any tree is good enough. So they're using eucalyptus all over the world. They're using non-native, uh, you know, Aust uh, Australian pines and Mexican pines in the wrong places. What a waste! We could be putting in the native plants that would support biodiversity in those places at the same time. A tree from Australia is not going to help. Uh, biodiversity in Peru. And that's that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the reason to use native plants. But the connection between 
between doing this, reducing the area in lawn, for example, and helping climate change is that grass is the worst plant choice for sequestering carbon. It has tiny little roots. We mow it every week, so it releases all the carbon it, it sequestered that, that week. Any other plant choice is better. Uh, so again, you know, 44 million acres of land, that's, that's, we've got 135 million acres of residential landscape. It's a lot of, of opportunity to put the plants back that are going to pull a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. And I, I think you make a great point. It's not just about planting a tree. You have to choose the right tree. Um, we have some questions about um, sort of agriculture and, and growing food. So in terms of growing native um, plants for food and um, you know vegetable gardens, are these part of the homegrown national park ethos or are they not contributing in the same way to, to that ecosystem? It's a different goal. It's a different goal. We don't plant vegetable gardens to help biodiversity. We plant vegetable gardens to get vegetables for ourselves. And that is a fine reason. It's local agriculture. You don't, you know, don't have to go to the store to get it. You can control what goes on it. Um, it's a wonderful way to spend time out, outdoors. So I'm not trying to discourage local gardening, the local food gardening at all. Um, it's just not the same thing. There's, it's another important use of our properties. And I think there may be some species like blueberries that would be uh, yes. providing both benefits, but those are maybe the exception rather than the rule. Uh, yeah, well, we, we do eat blueberries, but yeah, most people, you know, they're growing their tomatoes and they're growing their, their, their cabbages and things like that. And that's, that's great. That's fine. Oh. Yeah. Blueberries are in the top 10. I mean, they're a rare, wonderful plant. Uh, we have a question from someone on suggestions for a novice on how to start documenting caterpillars on their landscape, especially if you're not a caterpillar ID expert. Well, I would I would start by buying one of Dave Wagner's books, like Caterpillars of Eastern North America, so they have nice pictures of what they look like, uh, and um, and names and describes what their host plant is, where to look for them. The key is developing a search image for them. Remember, the caterpillars do not want to be found because it's usually the birds that find them. So they're very good at blending in. They're very good at crypsis. They look like bark or they look like the leaf or they look like leaf damage. Um, they're hiding from birds all day long. So the best time to look for caterpillars is at night. Go out with a flashlight. When they're not hiding from birds, they come out on the leaves and they're eating away. It's much easier to find them. And of course, looking on the productive plants is, is important too. Uh, do not, I would not look for caterpillars in the, the spring, right at the heart of bird breeding because they've eaten them all. They're so good at finding them. The best time to look for caterpillars is say uh, end of July, early August. Populations have rebounded. All the birds have fledged and you know they're looking for carbohydrates at that point. Um, you get good at it. Great. Well, it's a great suggestion to look at night. I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, a couple more questions about leaves. Is is there a, a layer that can be too thick for yes. the, the plants and the, the soil below? Well, it's not going to hurt the soil, but it, it it you know if you pile them up five feet thick, it's going to prevent anything from coming through there. It's true. The leaf litter um, you want to mimic a normal layer of leaf litter. Um, so some, you know, sometimes it can be, sometimes the wind will blow that and hit, like there's a part of my house where it blows the leaves and hits the house and it tends to pile up there. That's not normal. My house normally wouldn't be there. Um, so you want a normal layer of, of leaf litter and then the plants come through without any problem. But if, if, if it's too thick in some places, then yeah, uh, I would, I would break them away and I would start in March. You, you want that, that blanket on the ground during the winter time to preserve the moisture. Uh, and it does keep the heat in the ground. The, you know, deep below the frost line is 50 degrees down there. And that heat will, will generate, it'll keep the plant roots uh, from, from um, freezing in a critical way. Uh, so the hardest thing on life in the winter time is cold and dry combined. So the leaves keep the moisture in the soil and it really helps. That's great. Good advice. Um, we have a question about GMO plants. 
and wondering if you could comment on their viability and, and role in the ecosystem. Well, most of our GM and pro, GMO pro, products are agriculture. You know, we got GMO corn and, and, and uh, GMO soybeans. Those are the two big ones, GMO cotton. Um, the, the issue there, of course, they're, what they are is Roundup Ready. You can spray Roundup on them and it won't kill them, but it kills the weeds in between those plants. In and of itself, that's, that's great. The trouble is we, we misuse it. That seems to give growers the, the license to spray everything right up to the road. And along that, the, their, their fields is where the weeds, the milkweed, the esters, the goldenrod, all the things that supported the monarch and all of our native bees, that's where they used to grow. Over tens of thousands of miles of roadways in the Midwest and agricultural areas. Now that's sprayed and planted with grass. So there's no biodiversity there and we have to mow it. So there's two, two evils right there. The, the monarch has just been red listed because, um, because of the loss of habitat along roadsides. The, the biggest population of monarchs that was ever recorded was 1976. That wasn't before agriculture. It was coexisted with agriculture for a hundred years at that point. So they can coexist, but you got to put their host plant back. That's where GMOs have hurt the most. But the technology in and of itself, um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with it. It's one more tool. Remember what we used to do before we had, had GMO products was to fly over with an airplane and just release all the all the spray. That wasn't better, believe me. So um, people, I know people are down on GMO and you know they're really down in the big companies that manipulate everybody and, and there are issues with that for sure. But the technology in and of itself actually reduces the amount of toxin that goes into the, the environment. Yeah, it's a great perspective. Um, speaking of, of sort of chemical additives, um, could you talk a little bit about uh, neonicotinoids and, yeah. <laughs> and insects? I know Massachusetts is enacting legislation to restrict that. Um, Good. But I think it's still a serious problem. Good. That, that neonics, imidacloprid, all of those guys are 7,000 times more toxic than DDT was to insects. Now people don't think about that. And they say, well, we don't use as much. You know, every seed you put out there, those pink corn seeds and the pink soybean, that's covered with, with neonics. Only 5% is taken up by the plant when it germinates. The other 95 washes off the seed into the water table where it's very persistent or it blows away as dust. And who knows what, you know, it's killing insects, who knows, who knows where. So there are a lot of declines of insects that nobody seems to be able to explain. Loss of grasshoppers in places where, where nobody's doing anything, we don't think. But they don't even count seed treatments as insecticides. For some reason, it's not, it doesn't count. It's, you know, tons and tons of this stuff goes in every single year. The big thing is it doesn't increase yield. You can compare yield in a field where you don't use it and where you do use it. And there's no difference. So why are we doing it? It's it's preventive. In other words, use it whether you have an insect problem or not. And the, the growers don't, you know, it's hard to get seed without neonics on it. And it's not very expensive. So they just do it. But it's it's terrible. We should ban them right away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got a question about, so have you, they're asking for your homestead, have you noticed any insect population decline with your plantings? So is there a sort of global trend that's being reflected or are you only seeing an increase because of your plantings? Yeah, that's a real good question. It's, it is hard to document insect declines because insect populations fluctuate so much normally. So you have to look at it over, over long-term. Um, I did notice, this uh, maybe three or four summers ago. I'm always out looking at caterpillars and I know what's on the trees and the populations were great. And we had a thunderstorm that dropped seven inches of rain in an hour. It was like a fire hose and it just scoured the, the plants. And after that storm, I couldn't find any caterpillars on the trees. And, and in, in my, you know, this is anecdotal, but it seemed like it took two or three years for the population to recover from that one storm. 
And when you look wow. around at, at the extreme weather we're getting, the floods and the fires and the drought and everything else, it really is hammering insect uh, populations, at least in those, those local perturbances. Um, so there's data that says in places that are not disturbed, insects are not declining, and that's great. The problem is it's called the, the lifeboat effect. If you only measure, if the, if the ship is sinking, and you only measure insects on the lifeboat where you know a few of them are in these little places that are protected and say, well, insects are fine. If you measured them on the, the sinking ship, you'd see that they're not fine. And every time we develop an area and take down the trees and do all the things we do, there's insect declines. So Dave Wagner says, there's no way you can add 8 billion people to the planet without insect declines. And, and he's right, unless we really start to landscape in a way that supports them. So in general, when I look at the amount of insects that, that were on my property when we started versus now, I got a lot more insects. So it works in the long term. It's a good reminder, though, to, to look at the big, that we should be looking at the big picture, too. Um, a question here about, and I think we have time for just a couple more. Um, a question about, do birds specialize in their insect choice the same way that insects are specializing on their plant choice? And if so, could you give a few examples of that? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, not in the same way. Um, in, birds like good tasting insects, particularly caterpillars, not hairy caterpillars. So there's groups of caterpillars like the inchworms, the geometridae, that are not defended with hairs and most of them taste good. The birds love them and they go, go to them. Which species it is, they don't, they don't care. They'll take the big ones, they'll take the little ones. Actually, when they're trying to feed their young, they go for the biggest ones they can find. That's fewer trips and, it, and the young are growing really, really fast. Um, but they are, you know, whether it's a native insect or not, um, they don't know and they don't care. They just want it to taste good and be, be nutritious. I had a pair of bluebirds that uh, several years ago, it was a cold, wet spring. There were very few caterpillars out there, but there were sawflies, which look just like caterpillars. It's actually a type of, of, uh, type of wasp, it's a hymenopter, but they're on our, on our pines. It's a non-native sawfly, but they were very numerous that year. And the bluebirds reared their entire uh, clutch off those, those sawflies. They don't care that it came from Europe, you know, and that they didn't taste bad and it, and it worked. So they're not as, as fussy, but there are things they will avoid. All right, and I think our, our last question is um, a question about cultivars and um, their value to, to birds and insects. And if you have any commentary on that. Um, sure, I mean, it's, it's a very common question. And the answer is it depends on what the genetic change was that created the cultivar. A lot of our cultivars are, are natural variants that were found in nature and somebody just put a name on them. Um, we looked at six cultivar traits. We did an experiment in Mount Cuba Center looking at six cultivar traits. The only one that reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that loaded the leaf with anthocyanins which uh, are feeding deterrents. And so I would avoid the red leaf cultivars. Um, now we didn't look at any flower traits. So most cultivars do focus on, on flowers. And when you're changing flower structure and shape and color, um, very often you are reducing the amount of nectar and pollen that's available because you put that energy into bigger bigger uh, petals. You're, you're probably messing up the specialized relationship with those specialist bees that are, they want that particular color and the shape and, and the, the pollen structure. Um, so uh, Annie White at the University of Vermont has found that cultivars of flowers more often than not uh, disturb pollinator relationships, but not always. There are cultivars that actually attracted more bees. So it's not a, it's not a, a you know, black, black and, and white. white. Yeah. It's a, it depends. And of course you can figure it out really quickly. Plan them and see what comes. <laughs> and if nothing's yeah. coming, you can do this great advice. With, with echinacea uh, cultivars. There's a zillion echinacea cultivars. You can put them right next to each other. And some of them are untouched. They're just not attractive at all. Others are, you know, the, the visitations are fine. So yeah. one, one thing I'll say about cultivars is they have, they're propagated clonally. So they have zero genetic variability. And we know in this day and age with, with climate change and all of the, the, um, 
the stresses that we're putting on our plants. The, we want as much genetic variability as possible so that they can handle these, these stresses. So from that perspective alone, I would minimize their use. That's a great, that's a great point to close out the evening. Um, thank you, Doug. This was really wonderful. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, this program was recorded and the link will be sent around to everybody. And I think we had a question asking Doug if, if you would be willing to share your email address um, and respond to questions or we can try and filter them through um, if there's any lingering questions that didn't get answered. I, I don't mind. I don't mind if you share it, um, but I'm not guaranteed that I can ask answer all the questions. <laughs> you know, I, I did a webinar in, in Ohio and I got 400 and some odd questions. I can't. Oh. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> Take you all year to respond. Give it a try. Give it a try. But yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I would like to just mention before we close that our website is lincolnconservation.org. We have a great pollinator initiative that we've been doing for the past three years, planting um, pollinator habitat on conservation land and encouraging people to plant in their backyards and front yards. And if you're interested in getting involved with that or volunteering to help pull invasives or work on the trails, we really encourage you to reach out to us. Um, and you can sign up for our e-newsletter and hear about more great programs like this one. So with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Doug, and have a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody.